All right, I think everything's set. Sorry, it took me so long. I don't know what's going on today. Uh, all right. So just, uh, you know, I just mentioned this a little bit, but just don't forget there is that extra credit. Um, and uh, like I just saw a really interesting talk yesterday about um, kind of making uh, gene therapy much more efficient using uh, basically machine learning. Uh, so that was kind of cool. Uh, there was another one today that I couldn't go to because I had to give a lecture. Um, and I thought it'd be awkward if I gave the lecture while I was in someone else's lecture. Um, otherwise, uh, there are, um, I don't think I have any other announcements at the moment. I hope everybody had a good spring break. But let's start with questions. All right, so the first one, and so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to kind of cover highlights from like all of the lectures so far. Uh, so the first one is put these in the correct order of following uh, the data science life cycle. We talked this, about this in the very first lecture. Oh, that's what I was gonna tell you. So um, what I'm gonna do is for, let's say, Everyone in here who gets 90% or more of the questions correct, I'm going to randomly draw someone from that pool and uh, they get a prize. So try to do well. Um, I also am totally comfortable with you uh, searching the internet as fast as humanly possible while you do this. Um, so, you know, feel free. Uh, and uh, the prize is uh, pretty cool, I hope. And I will bring it to next lecture, basically. Um, for some of these, I might recommend opening Top Hat on your computer because there's some of them are like the matching and stuff. Um, but you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, I think most people in your age bracket use a phone even faster than I do. So, There's a lot of questions, folks. You gotta move faster. Come on. We only have 16 hours of lecture left. All right, so we have 52 people registered, so I'm going to generally cut it off at like 50, unless they come in and have them all at once. So we're at 49, so get that last one's in. All right. So here is the correct order, and I'm going to show a slide in a minute, but um, oh, can you read that? It looks really small to me. Um, I don't know if I can, I might be able to zoom in. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's a little better. Not great, but a little bit better. Hopefully you can read it on your own screen. Um, so frame the problem, collect raw data, process the data, explore the data, perform in-depth analysis, and communicate results. And we will go to the next slide where we have a pretty picture. Um, all right, so here it is just kind of in order with, you know, puzzles and you know so that it looks like more marketing-esque and makes you feel better about you know following process um does anybody know why it's important to kind of remember this do you have any theories versus you know getting a good grade on a test like some real reason what do you think any ideas I mean, you want to be consistent when you're creating multiple tests all the same process. So right. So yeah, so consistency is important for this kind of stuff, right? So um, if you have like a process to follow, it's easier to repeat that process, right? If you do it each time. You have another theory? Um, the process, the data step, 
Is that more so just like cleaning it for the extent of what? Yeah, it's, it, that's, a, that's a pretty name for cleaning data um, to make you not realize how painful that can often be. And then like, wouldn't there be like another like processing step after exploring? Uh, arguable, arguable. Um, so it depends, like, I would say that this, this isn't necessarily always this way, right? Sometimes you kind of go forward and then you go back and then you go forward and then you go back, but it's important to kind of uh, cover them all, right? Which is actually going to lead to my other point. Another reason to remember a process like this is because it keeps you from forgetting a step. Okay, like is there something that I'm not planning for? Like, especially if you're coming up with a plan that you're going to propose to do something for someone, you know, don't forget to clean the data, right? That often can take a lot of work. So you do want to make sure, you know, if you kind of have it in the back of your head, make sure you don't make uh, you don't miss something too. So to clarify, what is exploring the data? Is processing the data, cleaning it, is exploring it, just looking at it and understanding it. Yeah. So so exploring the data is just looking at it. However, um, right now, most of the data that you're looking at is, is not too complex. Um, so it's as a result, exploring it is often doable with kind of quick and dirty methods like a histogram or a chart, you know, of some kind or another, where you can kind of get an idea of what's going on in the data. Sometimes even just looking at the tables can be enough. But when you start talking about huge data sets like the census data set or the complete blue bytes data set, things like that. We actually have tools that we use that we would talk about in more advanced classes um, to try to explore the data, like not mathematically, but like programmatically uh, more than we've been doing so far. So we've been doing a little bit of it with things like grouping and pivot tables and histograms and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then there's even more sophisticated methods when you kind of get even uglier sets of data. So, so that's why I put just in heavy quotes because all you're doing at the end of the day is trying to figure out what the data is, but that can actually be quite a lot of work. All right, moving on. And maybe, there we go. All right, so this is a matching one. So match the term to, I couldn't just quite decide what to call it, but you know, definition or example on the right hand side. <coughs> Hopefully this is all super easy for all of you. But I also tried to use different language so that it would uh, be helping stick in your brain, hopefully. <laughs> All right, get those last answers in. All right. That's the popular. This is the right. There we go. All right. So, individuals, like each row in your data. Um, so, if you think about each row, right, that's an individual. Um, individual has a lot of synonymous terms. Uh, so, you know, but the, the kind of real one is individual. Um, but, you know, you can use the synonyms most of the time. That'll be fine. Um, the treatment is what you apply to the group. Uh, so this might be giving them more chocolate. It might be giving them a placebo drug. It might be, um, you know, looking at whether they take the green line, right? Um, and the horrifying thing that that is. Um, and then the outcome is the results you're measuring, and that's it. So, we have another question about that, which I think it's open. Yeah. All right. So, just matching again, same idea um, between the term on the left and the kind of definition example, whatever you call it, on the right.
All right, we're 49. Give up answers in. All right. And then this one, the correct answers. Association, so there's a link between the two things, whatever it is. Um, causality is one thing causes the other. And then confounding, which is still one of my favorite words because I think it sounds like what it means. Um, and But that's when there's other things affecting the outcome which are messing with your results, basically. So you've applied a treatment, but now you have external forces that are not part of your treatment that are actually affecting your outcome. So therefore you, it's difficult to figure out is the treatment doing the thing, whatever it is, or is it these confounding factors? And then we have the kind of formal definition slide. Um, so all of these you should have seen before, um, but you know, like I said, individuals has a lot of synonyms, um, but you know, individual is the, the correct term. Uh, the treatment, the outcome, association, causality, and confounding factors. Um, yeah, so let's give me a second to read that one. But I explained most of them already. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. What would you say is the best way to identify confounding factors? <laughs> uh, that is an easy question to ask and a very difficult one to answer. Um, so, what is the best way to identify confounding factors? So it's basically, this is what, why there are like full classes and schools of work or whatever in experiment design um, is because of this problem is that you, you basically need to ensure that whatever uh, your treatment is, is actually the only thing affecting the outcome or controlling for the confounding factors, whatever they might be. Um, do you have a, yeah, and, and going off, you also want to have like the people with domain specific knowledge to know what well. Right. So, so this is where, and I haven't really talked about it this semester, but um, I, because I come out of like the software industry, um, what we refer to any given like field is what we usually call it the vertical. Okay. So, like the automotive industry is a vertical, um, or, you know, actually higher education is another vertical. Um, as distinguished between a, a vertical and something that's horizontal. So horizontal, like software development, data science, those are horizontal things to know, right? They can be applied to any domain, whereas a vertical knowledge is things that are applied to one single domain and you get really you know, good at that one thing. Now, normally speaking, when you're doing kind of data science or computer science or whatever, if you're doing it in some sort of industri industry setting, you need to learn the vertical, which you will not have learned in college. Um, and if you work in like a consulting company, which is what I did, uh, you need to learn lots of verticals, right? Um, and so your, your rapidity, basically, of how fast you can learn a vertical can make a big difference to how quickly you can run a project. And without knowledge of that vertical is where, so confounding factors can really nail you. Um, and so one of the things I was gonna kind of comment on is when you're doing the homeworks and the labs and uh, you know the projects or whatever, there's a lot of explanatory text around it, right? That doesn't actually seem related to the data science work you're doing, right? It'll be about, um, you know, like about the census and how the census works, for example. Part of what I'm hoping that you're getting out of that, right, is the ability to quickly consume that and like kind of start to learn that vertical quickly, right? Because the better you can learn verticals quickly, the more the, the better you'll be able to consume them. So I know there's a number of people in here who are not kind of tech majors, right? So you already have some vertical you're really interested in, let's say journalism or poli sci or something like that. Um, so you you already are learning that vertical very deeply, right? But you might need to learn some others, right? Journalism is a great example because it's almost more horizontal. Because you journalism, you might need to give, you know, do reporting, data science, or something. Uh, something I worked on, for example, is like a school comparison, like like elementary school comparisons in a, a region. Um, so I, now I need to learn something about the education system, even though what I was trying to do was actually produce content for an article for a newspaper. 
right? So it's journalism, but I had to learn something about school to be able to speak to it credibly. So it's a, it's a very applicable skill in a lot of ways, but part of the reason you're reading that explanatory text is to give you some experience with how do I consume that vertical information as efficiently as possible because you wanna look for the important bits, right? What I often say about programming, like I can actually program in probably like eight different languages, but I don't actually remember each individual language. What I do is I remember the differences between them because the structure of programming is basically the same. So I just remember the diffs and you do, you start to do the same kind of thing with verticals. You know, you try to find analogs to things you already know. Make sense? That was a, like I said, a very long answer to a very short question. All right, next question. Uh, if you hadn't guessed previous to now, um, one of my favorite example variables is cow. And when failing that, I use chicken. Um, so that's why you will see cow turn up in a lot of my content. So just keep in mind, we are looking for the name of the Python type, not the word for this thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so I'll give you a hint. There's a lot of people with the wrong answer because their answer is way too long. Remember, programmers are lazy. All right, I see some answer editing. That's good. That's good. I'm not seeing a lot of changes over here, so I'm going to call it there. Okay, so, so the correct answer is STR. Okay, why is it? Why do I am I beating on this? Right? What? Why is it important that you know this versus this when I'm talking about the Python type? So if you want to know how to do a typecast, so if you want to turn a number into a string, for example, um, that's part of it. What else? Any ideas? So for me, the big one here is uh, for comparison. Okay, so if I want to know that the thing is a string versus a number, um, I need to be able to compare it to STR. So that's why I kind of harp on it a bit, even though I know it's it may seem kind of stupid, um, but that's why it's important. And uh, just to continue to harp on it, this was a lot harder. Uh, I will be impressed if uh, more than 50% of the class gets this one. Um, but I did give a bunch of options that I considered correct. So is this a long or a short answer? Uh, the, the correct complete answer is, let's see, uh, to, uh, 13 characters long. The complete correct answer. Like I said, this one's really hard. So, um, however, I did recommend cheating. So, you know, there is the internet. You might be able to find the answer if you search quickly or if you have a Jupyter notebook open.
probably shouldn't use the word cheating, but you get the idea. The variation on answers is also interesting. All right, we might have to call this one a wash because I see a number of people who typed in the correct answer, but the top hat is not matching it as the correct answer. So I don't know what's going on with that. All right, let's call it there. Loop. Okay, so. This is the correct answer. I don't know why it's not matching is the correct answer uh, because that's what I typed in. So I don't really know the deal. So why do I say it's the fully complete correct answer? Because this is the name of the library, right? And then this is the name of the thing that's the result. But we almost always write it as, can I scroll over there? Or is it only showing me like top answers? Oh yeah. We almost always, somebody had it. Uh, I told you there's a wild range of uh, answers. Um, so, so I would have probably taken it, taken it, and I think I put it in there this way. This is why I don't really know why top hat tells me. But we often do it as np.nd array because we shorten the numpy to np. Um, so, and I also I I tried to say nd array was okay too. Um, however, spelling does matter. So. <laughs> All right, so like I said, I don't like. Is there a space between the dots? Maybe. It looks like there is. I mean, I just like I typed it in. You know what I mean? Um, so whatever, we'll just call that one a wash. But like I said, that's the full complete answer. But I kind of took those other two as well um, because they're they're close to correct. Um, but yeah, so when you're using something all the time, it's helpful if you know what its type is. Uh, all right, so one more that's hopefully less painful. All right, remember what is the name of the Python type, not the word. I don't understand why there's always so much fluctuation in the number of people who are answering. All right, let's call it there. All right, so int is what we were looking for, which is the Python type. All right, another question, but this one is of a different sort. So which of these is not a table operation? Uh, there may be more than one. So uh, select all that are not uh, operations you can do on a table.
All right, I think I'm going to call it there. It doesn't seem to be changing. Get your answers in. Anybody left? All right. All right, so there is no include and there is no kill. That one I thought was kind of a gimme. Um, yeah. It's still, a, I would consider that still an operation, yeah. But sorry. Yeah, that's that one's that's on the fence. Um, but so I kind of threw in kill as a as a little bit of a gimme. Um, how many is this? How many people here know when I say kill what that means in like the tech world? Anybody? Yeah. Terminate a process. So terminate a process um, is where it traditionally comes from, but now it's kind of grown to mean basically getting rid of something. So if you know if you saw a kill as an actual operation, it'd be like drop, right? So it'd be like you know whack that thing. Um, but so I kind of threw it in there for fun. Um, so I'm sorry about columns if uh, if we don't consider that in the in the list. All right, next one. Okay, so what type of attribute is from a fixed inventory? So this is going to be way throwback, right? So uh, if you remember the attribute types, there's two big classes of them. Um, and this is one of them. And this is a, an attribute of data, not, not a slight attribute in Python. For This one, this one has also generated some interesting responses. All right, so remember, this is not the Python term. This is uh, the general data term. So it's unlikely to be a Python response. All right, get those answers in. I'm going to try clicking a button that I haven't tried before. Hopefully, it's going to go well. Ah, no, that's not what I wanted. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, the correct answer was categorical. Um, so, that's one of the types of attributes. Um, I think the next question. It talks about the other type, so I'm not going to say it yet. Oh, no, it doesn't. Okay, so so the other type, we'll talk about it in a second, but it's categorical and numerical. Um, and uh, so we'll talk about those in a second. But for this one, what term do we use for the frequency of individuals having a value? Okay, so it uh, often comes up in terms of a histogram. As it comes up with histograms. But what do we call that? Yeah. 
So somebody put in a, an answer that I would definitely accept, but didn't think of. That was part of the delay on the midterm results, in fact, as I went back and rewrote some of the auto grader because people came up with close answers that uh, I thought were also acceptable. All right, get those answers in. Oh, and let me let me reiterate, spelling matters. <laughs> Although I can really appreciate one of the misspellings. All right, let's call it there. So the correct answer was distribution. The one that I was saying, I didn't think of this. Density, I think, could plausibly be used for that as well. Um, but uh, I didn't think of that one as a possible answer. Uh, so, but distribution was the correct answer, uh, not distribution, um, which, oh, you can't actually see that one. Um, but uh, I, I thought that sounds like something really funny to me. So I like it. And, oops, wrong button. All right, so categorical. So each value is from a fixed inventory. Usually they're text, right? So this is like, um, you know, spam and not spam, right? Okay, those are categorical uh, values. Um, numerical are ones that are numbers. However, uh, don't forget about encodings, right? So uh, we talked about in the census data that uh, gender was encoded um, as, you know, zero was undefined, one was men, I think, and two was female. Uh, so that's still a categorical thing, even though it happens to be numbers. Okay, because the, when you say it has a number, it means that the number has an order. Okay, so a thing like a date, for example, is, is can be a number because it has an order. Uh, okay, so values can be numerical or categorical, and many subtypes within these. And so the values are like the the inside of your table, right? You know, you have the the column labels, right? And you have the rows, um, and the content in the middle is the are the values. And then distribution um, is, you know, the frequency of the individuals uh, that have that value. So in a way, it's like making uh, a numerical thing into a categorical thing. Okay, that's what we're normally trying to do with that. So, you know, if you think like ages, right? Ages are an ordered numeric thing, but we often want to know how the distribution is between like zero to 10 years old, you know, 11 to 20 years old, et cetera. So we're kind of making categories out of the numbers. Make sense? All right. Do we have any questions? All right, more questions. Hopefully this is entertaining. It's entertaining for me. All right, so name a type of graph used for numerical values. Just use, and to get it correct, so I don't have to type every possible variant under the sun. Um, just type the name of the thing in, not the word graph, okay? Oh, and sorry, this is also scoped to the ones we've talked about in class. There are a lot of other types of graphs that we have not talked about that may fit this category. Have we talked about multiple types? Yes. Okay. So both would be a correct answer. Either would be a correct answer. Yeah. Um, however, as with the other ones, uh, I see that people have thought of ways to type this that I did not think of that are also correct. So.
but suspecting that this would happen, that's why I said the prize will be pulled from the people who get, let's say, 80% correct, right? Uh, because so many of them are going to kind of have to toss out. Although one of these I can't believe I didn't think of. All right, almost everybody got their answer in. All right, let's call it there. All right, so, okay. These are the correct answers. I would have taken a line if I thought to type it in. Just, I didn't occur to me as a correct answer. I don't know why. Uh, I think it's because I was staring at a thing that said plot. Um, histogram is not correct. Okay, so a histogram you use for distributions, right? You don't do it with numerical data, it's for categorical data. Okay. Um, oh, same, same in the bar graph. Okay. So now we have pictures. Um, so yes, yeah, so I was staring at this and I just, I read the word plot and did not think of the word line. Um, but, you know, so this is a line graph, right? And there's a scatter plot. Uh, and those are what we use to do numerical uh, comparisons. Um, did you have a comment or, oh, sorry. Um, and so, yeah, handy to remember. Uh, and I think I may have, sorry, why is this not flipping? All right, so this was a little easier. What are the two types of graphs we've used for categorical data? I also just gave away the answer for getting that I had this question. Really? Okay, uh, so I think you can choose either. Right? Like I just wrote the, the sentence isn't great. Yeah. So, yeah, so it is for like numbers. The thing is, what you're doing is you're turning it into categories, right? So, I think of it more as like a categorical thing. The problem, the confusing part is that you do it based on numbers, like based on numerical data. So, it's a categorical view. But it's based on numbers. Does that make sense? It's one of those things. That it's like technically it's correct, but it's like weird, right? It's just kind of hard to hard to explain because of it's you're trying to figure out the distribution of those numbers. You don't care about the numbers themselves. Make sense? Okay. All right, I think that's pretty much everybody. Do your thing. All right, correct answer. Well, histogram and bar graph. Um, these are all real graphs, by the way. And uh, going back, I don't remember, was it you that I was asking when you talked about exploring data? Um, one of the things that you can use when you're looking at really complex data is a thing called a box plot, which is super cool, shows you outliers. Um, but we're not going to cover that, I don't think, in this course. Um, but it's it's still kind of neat, uh, and hopefully, all are familiar with pie charts. But we also won't be using those in this course. All right. So um, I boosted this off the internet. Um, I, this was something that never really occurred to me before. Is that one of the really obvious ways you can tell bar graphs of, uh, from a histogram is that there's no that there's gaps in between the columns on a bar graph and there aren't in a histogram. Uh, does anybody know why there aren't in a histogram? Right, right. So all of this is the graph, right? Whereas in the bar graph, this is the graph. Right, that the white space doesn't matter until you put it in, so it's easier to read. Right, 
But in here, it matters that how close they are against the spacer. Make sense? All right, cool. Next question. I don't understand why that was such a surprise to me. Uh, okay, so what do we call the information in the main, it should say in the main part of the pivot table? And I kind of alluded to this earlier. I am disappointed that no one has chosen cows yet. Is that probably what I would call it? <laughs> <laughs> they have now though cows is not the correct answer fyi as much as i would like it to be All right, get those answers in. It's always so hard to tell how many people are actually there versus it thinks they're there. All right, I'm gonna call it there. All right, so it is the values. Um, the attributes are more like the the like the the type of thing that's in there rather than the actual element, okay? So like, trying to give an example, like, uh, you know, if you had if you had the center part, right, it's, and it had, you know, three, five, and seven, the attribute is ages, right? Not necessarily, not the, the values themselves. All right, next question. All right, this is a fill in the blank. Uh, so I use a blank to view how one column compares to another. I'll give another hint here. We're looking for like kind of like a construct, not just a simple like table. All right, let's get those answers in. What was what? Uh, oh, it's like a construct, not not just the street table. Like something you do to the table. All right, final answers. All right, let's call it. Okay, so this is the big thing I wanted to draw out, right? This is not a group, okay? It's a pivot or pivot table. Um, the group is when you want to collect rows together, right? 
rather than when you want to compare like two columns to each other. So they have different uses. They, they seem very similar, but they are actually quite different in their output. Um, so yeah, so pivot table was the right answer, um, you know, but I took just pivot as well, um, but there it is. Uh, I suppose I should have taken, somebody actually gave the example in code. I probably should, could have given that, but. All right, what happens when I try to group a categorical attribute? And so there's, there's more than one answer, but I don't think you have to choose them all. Or there's more than one correct answer. There's four answers. <clears throat> All right, let's get those answers in, wrap it up. All right. The correct answers were NAN, which is short for not a number, um, and blank. Uh, depending on the environment, you'll get one or the other. Um, usually not both. So if you get used to one of them, it'll usually stick. Um, the potatoes was not the correct answer. Um, and the big thing I wanted you to realize is you will not get an error. It will, it will happily do it. It just won't give you a very good piece of like a very good result. <clears throat> All right, so little pivot overview. Um, so basically, you know, I'm looking for values over here, right? But basically, you're comparing column A and column B, um, and that's what the pivot's for. Um, and yeah, so I don't know. This is a. I think this is a good slide for remembering what they do. Um, the, the I have the one. It's not in this slide deck, but I gave it in a prior lecture, which kind of has what groups, what you when you use groups and when you use pivots. Um, so that's a good thing to keep in mind. All right, should need to move faster if I'm actually going to get to all the questions. All right, so I use the blank keyword to indicate the start of a method or function. Uh, so y'all know what a keyword is. Somebody want to tell me what a keyword is? Right. So, for example, if and for, okay, are predefined terms that you use in the language. I'm looking for the one that you need to be able to make a method. And on this one, unlike many of the other uh, fill in the blanks, the case will matter because it matters in Python. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, okay. So the question is like, what happens if you have categorical data kind of, um, and you try to group it? So it will give you the count, but the colors themselves won't merge. Yeah. That's different. Oh, sorry. With a group. Yeah. That's the if you group like let's say your column is called color. If you group by color and then say give me the count, it will give you a count, right? But any other categorical attribute will just be blank or name that are on the table. Yeah, so so not so it maybe should have been clear, but not the thing you're actually grouping on. All the rest of it.
All right, I'm going to call it there. And the correct answer is def, which is short for define. All right. I have a lot of questions. All right, so I use what keyword to send information back from my method? So usually the very last line of your method, this keyword is, is used. Another one of those places where it's very difficult not to use the word itself to describe the word. Okay, so for anybody who's doing this on the phone, remember autocorrect really likes to capitalize the first letter of words. That will not be correct here. And the reason I mentioned that is because I see someone did it. I have actually turned off auto capitalization on my phone because it annoys me so much. All right, get those answers in. All right, let's go to the next thing, the correct answers. All right, so the correct answer was return. And I'm very excited that whoever it was that had the capital R in return corrected it before we closed. All right, so methods and functions. Um, I like both these pictures, just uh, so this is, you know, kind of the function definition. So this is the name of the function. Uh, and then the first argument and the second argument, and then you can have infinite more. But then when you're creating a function, you need the keyword def, you give it a name for the function, and then you have uh, you know one or more arguments, uh, and then you have your keyword of return, and then whatever you want to return. Um, so this can be an expression, but it can also just be like a variable, or it can just be a number, or a string, it can be just anything. All right, next question. All right, uh, I know this one would be fun. So um, what are the kind of characters you use to create an array? Okay, and on your phone or whatever, you should be able to just tap it, but, or click on it with the mouse uh, and it should work, but I have never done this before. So hopefully I did it right. Probably should have chosen a monotype font. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What's the array that you're going to go send to your end agent? Array what? Uh, it actually doesn't matter. Are you talking about the input to the output? Like when we're creating an array, what we're using, or what's what's an array now? Yeah. What an array is now. Well, it's sort of. It's also when you create an array. If you're not using like make array. No, there's two different constructs. All right, let's close it. That's hilarious. Uh, okay, so that was the correct answer. Um, yeah, maybe I should this this one if you're if you're an advanced Python programmer, this is a little bit of a weird question. Um, but from the way we've been talking about it, that is the correct answer. So so maybe I should ice questions like this, but I thought it was cool to put the image map. 
All right, and then surpri unsurprisingly, we have the same question again, but for lists. But it did seem to work pretty well. So while you're uh, thinking about this, I just thought this was kind of funny. So square brackets parentheses or you know rounded brackets and we have angle brackets over there and squiggly brackets so i went and looked up to try to find out if there was like a real name of a squiggly bracket beyond squiggly bracket as far as i can tell there really isn't it really is just squiggly bracket uh so i thought that was hilarious Oh, so yeah, so squiggly bracket, curly bracket, they're both used. Um, but maybe so maybe curly bracket is the right one. But like I always assumed that it was like, you know, like uh like that there was like a formal name. So like, you know, like a straight up and down line is called a pipe, right? Or like an ampersand, which is like an and sign. So I figured there was something like that with like squiggly brackets, but yeah, you uh it's Microsoft programmers tend to use the term curly bracket. Uh, everyone else, all the all the real people use squiggly bracket. No bias there at all. All right, let's close that one. And oh, same thing again. So we use parens for lists. I think this is what I was saying. It's like you can actually use them kind of semi interchangeably um, because Python at its core doesn't really have a concept of the distinction between an array and a list. Sort of. <laughs> it, op it operates like an array in every other language. That's what I'm saying. Like, this is a after class kind of conversation. I'll spike questions like this going forward. Right. Yeah. There's Python's got some really weird constructs. Um, okay. So, long story short, uh, the way we've been using it, and I'm clarifying the way we've been using it, uh, arrays are all of the same type, um, but a list of things, and a list is mixed type. Um, and I don't know, I, I'm not, I'm not in love with this classification, so I may modify it, you know, kind of going forward. Um, but long story short, uh, and then groups, I just kind of want to mention here, even though they're not quite in this bucket, uh, but collect rows by some column, um, arrays, lists, uh, other things in Python called like dictionaries, and there's a bunch of others too. Uh, are usually under the general category of what's called a collection. Um, so that whole class of, of constructs are called collections. Um, so that was why I labeled the slide that way. All right, so control statements, uh, just kind of want to mention these. Uh, if, else, and elif, um, it allows for branch of code, and for allows for repeating the same operation. <coughs> I think I started to run out of questions, um, but so we covered this right before break. So it wouldn't surprise me if, if this is hard, um, but the probability addition rule will increase the chance of matching the outcome or will it decrease the chance of matching the outcome? So in other words, if you're adding two probabilities together, is it more likely that the thing, you know, will the probability go up or will the probability go down? Now we go look at the Python source code and see what it actually does. It's a function call. Yeah. All 
Alright, gibt es was zu sehen? Alright, so it increases the chance uh, of matching the outcome. So basically, when you when you put two probabilities together, if you add them together, it's going to make the likelihood of the thing uh, to happen higher, right? So then, intuitively enough, we now also ask about the multiplication rule. Will that also increase the chance of the matching outcome, or will it decrease the chance of the matching outcome? All right, get those answers in. All right, and it will decrease the chance of a matching outcome. So I wanted to just show you this again, basically. Um, but so, you know, if you kind of see, like at least for me, if you see it written out this way, I think it's, it makes it a lot easier. Like it's really obvious, I think. Um, so, you know, like basically there's two options with the addition. So therefore the probability is much higher, right? So, um, so that makes it easier. But with the multiplication, it's that this thing happens and that thing over there happens, right? So obviously the probability is gonna go down. Um, and then the last one that is uh, something I think that is not obvious and makes it, is to, you, you should think about this sometimes, is the complement. Sometimes the complement is easier to calculate than the actual probability. So the example we used in class, which I think is a really good one, is what is the probability of getting, you know, if you flip, flip three coins, what's the probability of getting a head at all, okay? So the complement to that is, what's the probability of getting all tails, right? Because that's the opposite. So that is much easier to calculate than it is to calculate what are all the different possibilities of heads. Does that make sense? So what you do is you take the complement and subtract it from one, and now you have the real one, or you have what you were looking for, sorry. All right, and then, yeah, I think that's the last one. All right, and then I just wanted to cover Jones again. Um, you know, I think this is something that a lot of people find quite confusing. Uh, so, you know, if you do, then it's, you're, you're in good company. Um, but basically what it is, is we have two tables of data, right? That have some relationship to each other, okay? And in this case, it's talking about the same cafes in both tables. So we can match the cafes. In this case, it's called location. In this case, it's called cafe. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Too much talking. Um, in this case, we match the cafe and the location, and we can result in a new table which has the data elements from both. Right? So that's all the join is for. Um, and when you're, uh, you know, kind of using it, um, basically you start with one table and then you join it across to the other table. Uh, there are shorthand ways to use join, but I usually write it out. Uh, kind of, I use the long form most of the time uh, because that way it's less confusing. So even though, like in there, if you if let's say both these columns were called cafe, you can actually drop the word location here. But I'll usually like obviously it would be cafe if they both said cafe. I'll usually type that cafe in anyway, even though it's not strictly necessary. It will figure it out. But I'll usually put it in anyway because if somebody else coming along looking at it, then they know that I, I didn't make a mistake, right? Does that make sense? All right, uh, I think that's it. Um, and my cool little charts uh, just came from this website. Uh, so I wanna give attribution and then that's it. <laughs>